Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry about this because I made some last minute edits to my slides, so hopefully I'm not going to say anything too wrong. Um, but I'm Sarah, and actually, despite the fact that we're in the blockchain session, um, this paper really is about transparency much more broadly. Um, so we're not even going to see the word blockchain until uh, like my second to last slide when I talk briefly about an application to Bitcoin. Okay, um, but this work is joint with Melissa Chase, who's sitting right there, um, and again, is really about this very broad theme of transparency. So what am I talking about? Uh, let's try to imagine a typical day in the life of uh, our friend Joe here, but really this could be, I think, any of us. Okay, so Joe wakes up, he goes, he makes some breakfast, um, you know, maybe he's on a bit of a diet, so he wants to record what he's eating, maybe he weighs himself, uh, he's gonna check some emails. Okay, so he gets ready, he leaves the house, he hops on some public transport, maybe he's listening to some music on his commute, gets to work, he's working on some documents, you know, maybe they're stored in the company Dropbox. Maybe it's time for Joe's lunch break, so he goes out, he gets some money out at the bank, um, you know, he texts with some friends, and maybe he's taking, you know, a vacation next week, so he finally uh, gets around to booking that Airbnb. Okay, so again, really typical day uh, for Joe and most of us, and so it's not even afternoon yet, and already Joe has just sent out into the environment a really massive amount of data about himself. Okay, things like his location, his health, how much money he has in the bank, uh, and so on and so forth. So the most worrisome thing is not just that this data is being generated and shared and, and sent, um, it's really that Joe's interaction with his own data is completely opaque. You know, he sort of has this interface, he presses enter, it records his data, he has one view of it, uh, but in terms of what else is going on with it, he really has no idea, right? So if he wants to recall an earlier event, you know, he's trying to see how much faster he's gotten on his runs or how much weight he's lost on his diet, um, he's sort of just relying on the app to tell him the right answer, you know, about what happened a year ago. He's probably not really remembering it too carefully himself. That's sort of why we are using these technologies. Um, but again, the, the more worrisome thing, and I, I think the thing that a lot of us in this, uh, in this room think about a lot, uh, is what, what else is happening with the data? You know, who else is it being given to? If it's his health records, you know, which doctors are accessing it, who else is accessing it, which advertisers are seeing his, you know, weight loss regime and stuff like that. And ironically, you know, the most we tend to hear about this kind of stuff is when it's hackers who have gotten our data in a breach um, and there's some kind of news article about, you know, how many records they got and so on and so forth. So the goal of this work is to really shed some light onto these interactions and expose a little bit of what's going on. So if we think of sort of an interaction that Joe has with this curtain as a system, then we can talk about events within this system, okay? An event might be really anything. It might be, say, an individual data access, either by Joe or by some third party like an advertiser. Um, it also might be the creation of an event. And so transparency is going to say that the bad events that take place in the system can be exposed. Okay, and, and obviously the good events are gonna be exposed as well, but it's really the bad events that we're most interested in, right? That we can tell if someone has violated a data sharing policy, um, you know, ourselves. Okay, so the main tool we're going to provide uh, to try to do this is a primitive we introduced called a transparency overlay. Here, roughly, is an overview of an overlay. Obviously, I'll be breaking it down. Um, my reason for putting it up at the beginning of the talk is if uh, anyone in the audience is familiar with uh, certificate transparency or the CT out of Google, um, you may say, wow, that looks a lot like it. Indeed, it, it does. Um, so I, you know, our work was really inspired by the design of CT and um, is really trying to sort of abstract away the properties they're providing and provide a formal treatment of the structure that they've proposed. Okay, so in terms of the rest of the talk, uh, I'm gonna, again, sort of tell you what's up on the slide now, sort of the design of the system. I'm then gonna talk about the security properties that we get, uh, sort of formally, that we would want. Uh, I'm gonna talk about our abstract construction of a transparency overlay. And then, finally, I'm gonna talk about the, the different systems that we can apply this overlay to, okay? So it's a very abstract thing. Um, and so the question is, concretely, what's, what can we apply it to and what kind of nice stuff do we get out of that? So just starting in with the design. Um, so we'll, now we're sort of viewing the system as just a completely abstract thing. 
And the first sort of entity that we're going to overlay on top of it is a distributed set of log servers. And unsurprisingly, these log servers maintain an object that we call the log. So um, it's, it's important for security's sake that it's a distributed set of log servers, so we're not putting our trust in any one entity. But you know, for the sake of the slides, uh, I'm trying to keep it relatively neat, so I'm just going to have one log server. But please do remember that there should be many. So the first thing that's going to happen, uh, remember I, I said there's sort of events in the system. So we have some kind of uh, algorithm that we just keep fully abstract by which the system generates these events. And now the system wants to include these events into the log. And this is done via some interactive log protocol that's run between the system and the log server. OK, so now we want to check after the fact that these events did actually get included into the log. So to do this, we're going to introduce another entity called, uh, called an auditor. OK, so the auditor is going to be maintaining a snapshot of the log. This is essentially a very succinct representation of the log, like something on the order of one hash. Um, and despite the fact that this representation is so succinct, the auditor is going to be able to efficiently check if events are in the log. And this is via this interactive check entry protocol, where the system basically says to the auditor, hey, can you check for me if this event is in the log? OK, so that's sort of our way of checking if specific events are in the log. Remember, the whole point is to expose bad events. So we also want to be able to look at all of the events in the log. So I should say the log server makes no promise about the quality of the events in the log. Okay, That's not their responsibility. They're not sifting through stuff during the log protocol and saying, well, this looks bad. The point is to log every event, good or bad, and then allow someone else to detect the bad events. So that someone else is called the monitor. The monitor we can see here maintains uh, quite a lot more information than the auditor. In particular, they maintain this snapshot. But they also maintain their own list of events, that's EE, -E, and a list of the bad events, and that's uh, what we call BE. OK, and the, the way they get this information from the log server is using this inspect protocol. And so importantly, um, this is, of course, going to be an inefficient process. OK, the monitor is going to look through every single entry in the log. So we sort of have this inefficient step where we're looking for the bad events, this very efficient step where we're looking for specific events. And so to bridge these two processes, um, we're going to introduce a gossip protocol. And this allows the auditor and the monitor to ensure that they're being given a consistent view of the log, OK? So that the, there really is a log, and that the log server isn't you know, trying to lie and trying to hide the bad events by showing only good events to the monitor and then sort of telling the auditor a different thing about what's in the log. OK, so the point of the gossip protocol is, of course, we can't actually ensure we have a consistent view, right? The log server can try to misbehave. But the, what the gossip protocol ensures is that if it does misbehave, the auditor and monitor can produce evidence of this misbehavior. And this evidence can be checked in a global way using this check evidence algorithm. OK, so check evidence can be run by anyone in the world. Um, and so this can essentially produce evidence so that people shift away from this log server and towards one that's uh, proved to be more trustworthy. OK, um, so this is the basic setup. Um, the idea is, what are we doing? We're just adding these three additional parties, the log server, the auditor, and the monitor. And um, as I said that there were many log servers, there also should be many auditors and many monitors. OK, so what do we want in terms of security? So the first property that I've already gotten at is this idea of consistency. OK. So the case we really don't want is the case where an auditor sees an event and says, yeah, this event is in the log. I believe the log server when they tell me that. But the monitor says, well, I don't have that event. OK, so that event is not in my view of the log. So formally, you know, we model this cryptographically using a game. Uh, in the game, we allow an adversary to take on the role of the log server and uh, the role of the system. And we say that they win if this case that I just described um, can't happen. OK, so um, they do give an inconsistent view to the monitor and the auditor. And yet, for some reason, the monitor and the auditor can't produce evidence um, of this misbehavior. OK, so this, this is what we don't want to happen. And so this is when we say the adversary is going to win if that does happen. OK, in addition to this idea of consistency, um, since we're talking about producing evidence of misbehavior and checking this evidence, uh, we of course need to consider the question of framing the log server. OK, so um, in particular, we have a definition of non-frameability, which basically says everyone can gang up on the log server. 
and they're going to win, the adversary is going to win, if they can make it look like the log server cheated, even though the log server is behaving honestly. Okay, and so we, we again, non-frameability says this can't happen. The final property we have, um, and this was one of the changes I, I made, um, I should mention, by the way, that a lot of these security definitions are related to a very recent paper uh, by Dowling et al. that looked at, at the specific case of certificate transparency. Um, so there's this other type of inconsistency that we want to prevent, and it's a little more subtle. So now the auditor and monitor agree that the event is not in the log, but the system has been promised that it will be. Okay, so we, if we consider that when the logging happens, the log server is actually issuing promises to include events in the log, accountability basically says that if it reneges on that promise, we can again produce evidence that it's done so, and this is evidence of misbehavior. So the game, um, the adversary takes on the role of the log server. Again, um, it's going to promise to include an event in the log. It's going to renege on that promise, meaning the auditor and monitor don't see it in there. But um, the, adver the case we don't want to happen is the case when we can't, um, it, we can't indicate that this happened. We can't produce evidence of the log server's misbehavior. And so accountability, again, says that this case can't happen. Okay, so again, um, the definitions really are mostly focused on this idea of consistency, this idea that the log server has one unified view of the log, and in allowing different parties to look at it in different ways, we're gonna capture bad events. All right, so these are the sort of three definitions, uh, and now I can get into our construction. So it turns out that our construction of this overlay can be fairly simple, uh, but we first have to get uh, an additional building block in place. So this is a building block that um, we call a dynamic list commitment, or DLC for short. Uh, you can see up here, this is a primitive that has gone by many names uh, using various different properties of it. If you wanna think of a kind of concrete instantiation of this primitive, since what I'm gonna present is rather abstract, um, you can think of either of the ones that we present in the paper. There's a rolling hash chain, which obviously is uh, somewhat inefficient. Everything's gonna be linear in the length of the list, um, or a good old fashioned Merkle tree. All right, so let's sort of motivate, uh, again, I'm sort of gonna do an abstract treatment, so let me try to motivate it in terms of the setting where we're gonna use it. So let's imagine we have this system. As I said, the system is producing events, and if we think of this red line as representing the movement of time, then we can think of events being produced you know, as time goes by, okay? So let's say first the system produces two events, first it produces E1, and then it produces E2. So the basic operations we wanna be able to do or we wanna be able to commit to this list. Um, so in particular, generate some kind of succinct representation of it. We of course wanna be able to check that a given thing is a commitment to a list. And then, you know, we have dynamic in the title as well, right? So as new events come along, we wanna be able to fold those events into the commitment as well and have them represented. So again, these are just sort of the basic operations that we need to be able to do to make this thing functional. In terms of a bit more security-minded things, uh, one property that we want of this list is we want it to be append only, okay? So in particular, if I have a list and I've given you a commitment to that list, um, the only thing I wa uh, we want that I can do to it is add new events. And so in particular, uh, oops. In particular, if say I realize that some bad events you know, snuck into the list, I can't delete them, they're in there. Um, if I realize after the fact that I like forgot an event, I can't go like retroactively kind of shove it into the earlier bit of the list. Okay, all I can do is append, and that's where we use these algorithms. And then finally, remember the auditor is sort of looking for these specific events. Um, and so for these, we use a proof of inclusion and a, a check. Um, that a given event is included. And this means that you can't omit events from the log. Okay, so this is sort of what I would describe, anything we describe in the paper as a, a basic dynamic list commitment. And again, if you think of Merkle trees, you know, probably anyone in this room could tell me how to do all of these algorithms using Merkle trees. So let's get a little more complicated, um, a little more exotic in terms of the algorithms. So let's first impose an additional constraint on the list. So again, thinking of our, our setting where we're gonna be using this, um, let's imagine, remember, this is sort of moving throughout time, generating these events. So in particular, we're, we're not gonna end up with a case that looks like this, okay? Where somehow the, the elements in the list are in this order that's different from the time in which they occurred, right? So actually, what we can impose on the list is an ordering. We can guarantee 
the, the lists we're committing to are ordered with respect to some notion of time. And it turns out if we have that ordering, uh, it really enables some additional algorithms that we can do. So one thing we can do is we can demonstrate when an older commitment to a list uh, or an older commitment is inconsistent with a given list, right? So if you come to me with a commitment and you say, is this commitment a proof to your, or a, is this value a commitment to your list at any previous point in time? I can actually demonstrate to you, no, it's not. Okay, and so this is uh, gonna be useful when we're sort of trying to compare versions of the log. And then similarly, I can prove non-inclusion of an event. So if you say, is this event in your log, I can prove to you, no, it's not. All right, oops, okay. So those are the algorithms. So now in terms of our construction using dynamic list commitments, uh, let me first describe to you what the objects now look like, okay? So in particular, a snapshot is basically going to be a signed dynamic list commitment. Okay, and sort of hinting at the security here, uh, this implies or gets at non-frameability, right? The log server is signing every commitment it puts out there. And so if it's creating inconsistent commitments, it can't really deny that fact, right? I mean, it's just, they're signed by the log server. So that's what a snapshot is. And then a log is uh, just really a list. Okay, a log is just a list of events um, and they're succinct representation in the form of this snapshot. Okay, so now let's get into how these interactive protocols work. So the first one is this log protocol. Fairly simple, actually they, they all are fairly simple. So the system is basically gonna go to the log server with an event, say hey I want to include this event. The log server is gonna say great, here's a receipt. Um, this is basically what we use to keep the log server accountable. Okay, so this is a signature on the event saying by a certain time I'm gonna do this. Um, the system's gonna check that that receipt's good and the log server is going to update the log. All right, and that's it. So now the event hopefully is in the log and now we can actually check that. So the system is going to send an event to the auditor and say, hey, will you check this event for me? There might be a brief moment of tension where the auditor says, oh shoot, my snapshot isn't up to date enough to catch, to catch this event. So what are they gonna do? Well, they can just update their snapshot in this nice little sidebar here. So the update process, basically they go to the log server, they say, hey, uh, here's my snapshot. I think it's a bit out of date. The log server can say, yep, here's sort of the difference between your snapshot and the new snapshot using this prove append thing. They can send back the new snapshot and the proof that this has been obtained from the old one only by these append operations. And then the auditor can check, okay? And assuming this all goes well, um, the update is complete and the auditor can now use the new snapshot as its snapshot. And obviously if anything along the way fails here, we just have to abort the protocol. So the auditor has now updated and now we can go forward with the main event, which is the auditor says, hey, is this event in the log? The log server says, why yes it is, here's a proof. Uh, the auditor checks the proof and they return back to the system whether the proof verified or not. Okay, so that's it. Basically, if it looks like the event is there using this proof of inclusion, great. If not, um, they'll tell the system to reject this event. So in terms of the inspect protocol, again, really quite straightforward. The monitor is gonna say, hey, this is where I'm at in terms of time. This is the last version of the log I saw. The log server can say, cool, let me figure out what's new since you last checked. Um, so it finds sort of the events since that snapshot. It sends back those events and the new snapshot. The monitor checks that this all adds up. Okay, so using this append thing, it says, if I, include these new events into my old snapshot, do I get your new snapshot? Um, and then using some out of band checks, you know, based on some sort of predefined policies specific to the setting, it's gonna update these bad events. Okay, so this is sort of out of scope of the work. So the final protocol is the gossip protocol. So the monitor and the auditor here are going to start by exchanging snapshots. So the monitor sort of says, here's my version of the log. The auditor says, here's my version. Um, now, what the monitor, you know, the monitor has the whole list of events, okay? They basically have everything the log server has. And so what they can try to do is demonstrate inconsistencies if there are any. So I should say there might not be. So of course, the honest monitor and auditor before they try to produce any kind of evidence are going to check if there are inconsistencies. Okay, but the idea is if there are inconsistencies, 
the monitor can actually demonstrate these, and they can say, you know what, I think we actually have different versions of the log. And in that case, they're going to output their signed commitments, so that's these snapshots, and this proof that inconsistencies were found. And then what check evidence is going to do is just check that this is real, okay, that these snapshots were actually signed by the log server um, and that this uh, proof of inconsistency checks out. So that's actually it for the construction. Um, I'm not really going to argue about the security. Hopefully I've, I've hinted at it enough, and of course there are proofs in the paper. Um, one thing I will say, so to really fully get accountability and um, also non-frameability, um, we work with a slightly augmented setting. So what I've described to you is basically what we call in the paper a basic transparency overlay. There's also this idea of a pledged transparency overlay where the auditor actually um, does an additional thing. So when check inclusion fails in the check entry protocol, they actually keep, they remember the events uh, for which it failed. So they keep track of their own sort of bad events, if you will. And then they go on to gossip with the monitor about those events, right? So they basically have events that the log server failed to convince them were in the log. And then they go on later to talk to the monitor and they say, hey, you know, I didn't, I wasn't convinced this was in the log. Do you have it though? And if there are events where neither the auditor or the monitor has them, but it looks like they should be in the log, then if you remember, that's exactly the definition of accountability, right? That that shouldn't be able to happen. Um, so again, just sort of slightly waving my hands, didn't want to make things too complicated in the presentation, but um, again, details are in the paper if you're curious. So um, in addition to sort of arguing that this satisfies our notions of security, I also wanted to convince you that our notions of security did get at the main goal that I said at the top of the talk, which is that bad events are going to be exposed. Okay, and just to, again, pretty thoroughly wave my hands and argue this. So remember how this works. The system is going to be promised that events are going to be included in the log. To check on this, the auditor is going to go and make sure that these events are in the log, you know, after the time that they were promised to be there. Okay? Then the auditor and the monitor are going to ensure that they have some kind of consistent view of the log. And so roughly, by consistency and accountability, if the auditor perceives this event as in the log and the system has gotten a promise that this is in the log, then the monitor is going to have it in their log as well. Okay? And then the monitor's view of the log is essentially a replication of the log. And so the, the whole point of the monitor is to take all the uh, contents of the log and sift through it looking for bad events. Okay? And so, voila, QED, um, bad events are really going to be exposed by this process. Okay, so if we think of the system as not only checking that events are in the log, not only checking that they have a promise, but also checking that their event is not in the monitor's list of bad events, then we can really stop, um, you know, verifiers within the system from accepting bad events. So, um, to finally talk about, you know, systems where this is useful, systems where th this can happen, um, I'll, I'll now get into some use cases. Okay, so the first use case um, shouldn't really be a surprise given what I said at the top of the talk, um, and this is certificate transparency. Okay, so here we can see sort of what this system looks like, and uh, again, our architecture is essentially the architecture of CT. So basically, you can view our proof of security for this pledged transparency overlay as a proof of security um, for CT. So we basically just get that as a corollary, which is kind of nice. So the other setting I want to talk about is the setting of Bitcoin. Okay, so the Bitcoin system um, kind of roughly looks like this, right? So there's a, a receiver. They ask a sender for some money. Uh, the sender creates a transaction. They kind of broadcast it out to the network. They hope it gets uh, picked up by a miner. The miner includes it in the blockchain. And then the receiver sort of checks in the blockchain that the transaction is there. Okay, so the sender sends the transaction to the receiver out of band so they know what to check for. So you can see here what it looks like when we overlay our system on top of this. The miner is now responsible for logging transactions. So once they've mined a block, they kind of send the whole block off to the log server. And the receiver is going to be running the check entry protocol with the auditor. Okay, and ta-da, double spending is exposed. So you might say, okay, that was happening anyway, right? I mean, that's the whole point of this globally visible blockchain is that anyone can go check double spending for themselves. Okay. Um, but we get provable security. Okay, so maybe the like few cryptographers in the room are like, yes, provable security. Again, probably most of you don't really care. Um, let me try again. 
So you'll notice here there's something sort of pretty unnecessary. The receiver is checking with the auditor that the transaction is in the log. They're also looking in the blockchain for themselves. That doesn't need to happen, okay? So in particular, we can just kind of cut out that step, and now the sender and receiver don't need to store the blockchain. And this is pretty nice, right? The blockchain these days is like 70, 80 gigabytes. You know, if the sender and receiver are just, you know, pretty casual users of Bitcoin, it is kind of a, a lot to ask that they maintain this whole thing. But again, I mean, I, I wouldn't be surprised if you're not blown away. Okay, so you could say, well, obviously, but the log server is still storing the whole thing, and they're still checking with the log server, and, you know, anyway, we have like SPV nodes and stuff like that, so, so what's the big deal? So let me try one more time to convince you that this is kind of interesting. So, you know, you'll notice, it, again, there's a bit of an unnecessary step here. The sender is broadcasting the transaction, and then we're telling the miner, hey, you need to be logging all of your transactions. So how about we just cut out the middleman? Um, and ask the sender to log the transactions themselves. Okay, so every time they want a transaction, they go to a log server, they say, can you include this? And uh, we get rid of mining, we get rid of the blockchain, and we get rid of all of that. Okay, and so this basically gives rise to a hybrid system. Yes, it has very different trust assumptions. Okay, so we're now relying on a distributed set of log servers as opposed to a fully decentralized, you know, fully trustless environment, whatever that means. Um, but, you know, the, the really nice property that I think is here is that we don't have mining. No one's hashing, or people are hashing, but in a much more limited capacity than what was needed to produce the blockchain. Okay, and so, um, and again, we, we still have pre global security guarantees and all that here. So just to wrap up, um, I thought I'd kind of present, you know, maybe a, a few open problems. So obviously the first one, um, you know, you might ask, uh, is this the right design? You know, uh, if you're familiar with this landscape, you'll say, well, you know, Conix doesn't use a monitor, they just use an auditor, so what can you get there? That's a lot more efficient, right? Interesting question. Um, do we really need all these three parties? In terms of security, you know, I started off with this whole data, um, data access thing. So, you know, certificates are, are, are public already, Bitcoin transactions are public already, things like data, not so much, okay? And so this really begs the question of privacy and of how we can incorporate privacy into a setting where we're still trying to log everything out there. Uh, the construction, obviously, you know, you can always do better, more efficient, better primitives, whatever, whatever. Um, and then finally, you know, I, I've hopefully convinced you this is a relatively abstract thing. Um, it can be applied in some, you know, fairly disparate settings. I would never, before I worked on this, have related CT and Bitcoin in my own mind. Um, and so the question is, you know, where else can it be useful um, and where else can it be applied? Okay, um, so that's pretty much it. Uh, the full version of the paper is online. Melissa and I are here if you have any questions. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for listening. Raphael Reischuk, ETH Zurich. Um, I have a question about deployment and uh, open participation. Because I wonder, what do you imagine? Who's running the monitors and the auditors? So how many will there be? How will you incentivize these people to run them? And how do you get the security right if, it, if you allow open participation? Right. Great question. Um, I'm just going to try to, this thing is so slow, uh, try to get back to the CT slide. Um, I'm basically just going to be feeding you, to be honest, the CT answer, because I don't really think there's a more convincing one out there. I'm not saying it is the most convincing either. Um, so in terms of the monitors, the CT's proposal is that monitors are the websites. Okay, so websites are essentially going to sit there and try to make sure that, you know, no one's forging certificates on their domain or something like that. Um, and then the auditor is uh, proposed as sort of a you know, a plug-in or a, a built-in thing to the client. Um, in terms of the log servers, there's not really a great answer, to be honest. I mean, at the moment, it's kind of like Google <laughs> is running them, which has its own set of problems. Um, but the idea, yeah, is that every, the, the, you don't need to provide the most robust incentives for the monitor and auditor because, you know, the websites already have incentives to check, say, that certificates aren't being forged and stuff like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a great question without maybe the best answer. Um, that's my best try. <laughs> René Meyerhofer, Johannes Kepler, University of Linz. If I understood it correctly, you implicitly assume that there's exactly one ordering of the events. Um, I assume there's a partial ordering, right? So in something like Bitcoin, for example, you yeah. might have, 
you could say every transaction in a block we essentially view as taking place at the exact same time. So within that, we don't have to order, um, but we can say that the, all the transactions in that block came before all the transactions in the next block. I can't at the moment understand how you would guarantee that even partial order if you got rid of the blockchain. In a widely distributed system. Um, that's a good question. So I guess in a absolutely completely asynchronous environment, that would be really difficult. So for example, what CT does in terms of the timing, so it's not like the exact time they receive, it's usually um, within what's called this, is it minimum or maximum? I always get it wrong. Uh, maximum, I think, merge delay. So it's usually, say, the end of the day, uh, local time for the log server. Um, you know, if you adopted something like that, again, you wouldn't be able to cover a fully asynchronous case um, but you'd be able to still get something. Okay, thanks. Aniket Kate Purdue, uh, nice talk. So my question was, you mentioned interesting future work, but uh, maybe the revocation is something, have you thought about? Uh, maybe you can use something from the already existing work or there's yeah. some scope there? No, that's another great question. I mean, I know Mark Ryan had this paper on um, adding revocation to certificate transparency. So um, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if those kinds of techniques could be adapted uh, here. But yeah, great question. Thanks for attending the session. Food should be right. Uh, out there, so no need to go upstairs, you can have lunch.